Moment of Wrestling with professional wrestler Colt Cabana. All right, how you guys doing? Come on in, sit down, relax. You're about to listen to the Art of Wrestling, a professional wrestling podcast. It's a life podcast, it's a personal journal, it's an entryway into the minds, the souls, the hearts, and the lives of the people involved in the world of professional wrestling. I am your host, my name is Colt Cabana, hello. I am a Mancunian, basically. I'm a convention goer. I'm a Hall of Famer. <laughs> Most importantly though, I am a professional wrestler and I am not coming to you live from my studio. That was all right. It maybe drowned out by the people back there, but we'll take, shall we, from my studio. Yeah, in Chicago, Illinois. No, I am here at 2018 Wrestling Media Con in front of a live studio audience. Before we go any further, this is a fan support and listener supported podcast supported by people just like you. We give it to you free of charge every single Thursday. ColdCabana.com, iTunes, SoundCloud, wherever you get your podcasts from. A couple great ways that you can support, rate, review, and subscribe on iTunes. Tell a friend, tweet it out. Go uh, leave this uh, area, grab some people back there, bring them back here, tell them to enjoy the show. The best way that you can support, though, ColdMerch.com, DigitalColt.com, T-shirts, buttons, pictures, posters, DVDs, Wrestling Road Diaries 1, 2, and 3, a children's book, and, and uh, so much more. That's all available at ColtMerch.com, DigitalColt.com. And then after this is done, you know I will be at ColtMerch.table.co.uk slash Belly's Gonna Get Ya, which will be right over there. Um, I just did the uh, Edinburgh Fringe Festival, for those of you who are familiar with it. Yeah. And... Just like here at the 2018 Wrestling Media Con, luckily enough, I was uh, help sponsored by Beer52.com. There's a quick uh, free plug for those guys. Go get yourself some beer if you want to. And I did a bunch of stand-up. And it's not surprising or surprisingly, like, people loved, people outside of my wrestling bubble in the stand-up bubble loved the reference to Butlins, like me wrestling at Butlins camps. Like, that would get a laugh. And then I, when I would tell them that the only thing I understood from, or the only thing I remember from my time at Butlins was Belly's Gonna Get Ya, um, just still don't understand. And just the other day, my friend Andy Colden showed me the advert for Belly's Gonna Get Ya. I don't know how that made television over here. It was just a giant fat roll chasing a person. I, don't, I wonder if like, I wonder in the, in the, Body shaming is always not okay, obviously, but I wonder in 2018, in the, term, in the world of body shaming, like, if they could get away with that. Um, yeah, I don't know. And then I was going to make fun of a wrestler, but I'm not even going to anymore, <laughs> so we'll stick with it. Uh, I did get inducted to the Hall of Fame last night. That was a very big deal in front of you guys. Yeah. And then I remembered Donald Trump is in the Wrestling Hall of Fame also. <laughs> And then I really went back to my hotel and I questioned myself. I was like, ah, uh, Pete Rose is in the Hall of Fame. I heard Coco Beware's parrot was also in the Hall of Fame. Like me and Frankie are on the same level, I feel. So uh, that was, no, that was an exciting moment. It's exciting to be here. You know, the, when I first came over to England, I lived in uh, Birkenhead for a little bit up in Liverpool. but. I did spend a lot of time in Manchester, so... Although, I mean, by a round of applause, uh, is that... By, by, by a round of applause, who here is from the Manchester, the greater Manchester area? And by a round of applause, who has traveled to be here? So all my local Manchester references will just... I'm not even gonna go for that fully cheap pop at this point, right? I could just do the cheap pop of Great Britain. Yeah. Fuck Brexit. Yeah. <laughs> That's how you win them over. Has anyone done a Brexit wrestling gimmick yet? Has that been done yet? Who does? Doug Williams does. 
Is that because he's leaving wrestling? Is that what? <laughs> Doug, I've been told Doug Williams is Mr. Brexit. And for a dumb American like me, I just, I, for honestly, for about three months, I thought they were talking about breakfast. And I know that you call breakfast dinner. That's, you, you call lunch dinner? You call lunch dinner. And what's dinner? Tea. I mean, you guys know how confused I am as an American, right? I came over to Edinburgh for, for six years. And up until last year, I kept on thinking they were talking about this one specific person, David Edinburgh. And I'm like, who's David Edinburgh? Is he the mayor of Edinburgh? And then someone told me who David Attenborough was. And I was like, oh, that's probably who they're talking about. But I don't know anything about science or the moon or space. All I know is about wrestling. <laughs> so that's all, like if you, to, if you said like, if you told me who Dave Meltzer was, I'd know who that was. I don't know Dave Attenborough. Uh, I do know a lot of other wrestlers and great wrestlers. We're gonna have them on the stage and I have a lot of fun guests for you guys today for coming up. You guys ready to start a show? Yeah. All right, uh, my first guest, he's uh, spending his time hard on the go. I don't know the rest of the words. Please welcome Jeff Jarrett to the show. <laughs> oh, that rhyme. <laughs> Jeff Jarrett, ladies and gentlemen, Jeff Jarrett. I butchered your song, Jeff. Ah, uh, yeah, good. Where was my music? Oh, no music. Oh, sorry. Oh, you're going to be like Vampiro sitting back there waiting for the music. <laughs> you, Shh. Not only good did, one. Not only did you see that, well, I mean, you're not, you're not here to talk, but you were there for that. I was in the ring. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was right in the middle of that. Oh. That was... Uh, that was bizarre. That was a thing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, for those of you who don't know, and that's not talking mean about Vampiro. I had Vampiro on this podcast. I thought he was amazing. Yeah. And his life story is amazing. I'm going to be a part of, uh, they're doing a documentary on him. Are they really? Yeah. So next week I'm in Toronto. I think they're going to do some uh, interviews with me. But down at Triple Mania, they were, uh, they've done like a year-long documentary on It's a pretty unique story. As you know, a, a kid from Thunder Bay, Ontario goes to a, another country and what a career he's had there. Yeah. I would love if they were doing the documentary and the credits start and like there's just the frame of him. There's a frame but he won't go in the frame until the music for the credits start. <laughs> <laughs> and he's plugged for that. Oh man. Yeah, he wouldn't go into the ring until his music was played and we only know that as fans like he has to live up to that because it was on the television, him going play my music. I, I just, and, and I sat there, I lived it, but then I got to go home and my kids, it sort of became a little viral sensation. Yeah. And you know Karen, you know her well, and um, my wife just looked over at me and she said, hats off to Matt Stryker. What a wonderful job he did there. <laughs> he tried to justify everything. Oh, I don't think you need your... It was, I was, if you don't know what we're talking about, you need to look it up. It was a special moment in professional wrestling. Well, let's talk about... Uh, I'd like to talk about uh, ring, an, or ring announcers or commentating, co commentators covering up. So maybe like Memphis. Did you... Who, so who were your guys when Lance you started? Lance Russell uh, uh, and Dave Brown. And um, boy, live TV, uh, as you can imagine, I have my coffee here. So uh, we used to run shows on Friday nights in high school gyms and armories, anywhere from 300 miles away to 100, you know, whatever, c close drive uh, on a Friday night. Then we'd drive into the hotel uh, in Memphis, Tennessee and get a room. And none of us um, went to bed uh, or, or very little sleep. And then you get up and you do uh, 90 minutes of live television. So At so what time? 10 o'clock, we came on the air. So 10 a.m. was on the air. So call time's like 7 a.m.? Uh, back in those days, the call time was 8.30. Everybody got there about 9.15. So we were on the air uh, 45. But, it, they just, it, they, but that's how I cut my teeth. But you, I mean, so when you were doing Raw and the show started at 8 Eastern, Call time was what? Noon. Noon. Yeah, eight hours. Which is pretty crazy to put that all in perspective. Yeah. So Memphis TV, 
was 40, 45 minutes before live to, TV. To be there. No, so that included getting your dress and walking through the curtain and getting your finish, and here's what we're going to do. But it was so raw and spontaneous. You didn't even have time to rehearse it in your brain, let alone talk to guys. It was going through the curtain. Um, and I want to try to stay on topic here, but there, there, was a, there was a lot of good stories. But the most famous story that probably hasn't been air, aired was uh, uh, Lance was out. And they had a sportscaster because um, anybody in here Memphis wrestling fans, so I want to try to – it's a little bit different. So in Memphis, Tennessee, Lance Russell was the program director, but he was was the wrestling guy. But Dave Brown was the weekly – he was on TV three times a day. He was the weatherman. So Dave was very well known in the community and and all that. But Dave was what you'd call what we called a color commentator. But really, they were sidekicks. Lance took the lead, and Dave was a sidekick. They were both babyface announcers. But they had a sportscaster. You've never heard this story, have you? No, (laughs) no. There's a sportscaster that set in, and and he was taking Lance's... um, I hope I do this story justice, because if Jerry Lawler was on this stage, he tells it better than anybody. Uh, but, but the sportscaster was there, and there was a match that got going real quick, and they did a jump start, a lot of action going on there. And the sportscaster says very, very calmly, oh, wow, there's a series of really phony kicks. Uh-oh, oh. there's a real one. Oh, God. He says, uh-oh, there's a real one. <laughs> <laughs> it was good. So uh, so what are the ramifications of, of, of that? Because that's the story. So is everyone just flipping out? Do they – like, in my head, Memphis – wrestlers they want to protect wrestling so bad the wrestlers go and beat the shit out of that sportscaster it was memphis tv 90 minutes and it's something that you never look back uh you, you just you, pretend you, it didn't happen you, you just kept rolling it, it was uh, you know the genie's out of the bottle you, you nothing happened i mean i'm sure my old man or lawler didn't invite the guy back but there was no need and he was a sportscaster an employee of the station so so there, there was you could, there was no ramifications it, it is what it is somebody you know, had to have pooped in his bag or oh something. yeah well oh. I, i'm i'm sure <laughs> randy orton's dad i'm sure <laughs> Uh, but no, Memphis TV, the, the commentators and that kind of stuff, uh, we used to always measure, uh, if we did something really good, I'm getting off topic, if we did really something good uh, on Memphis, Tennessee, we knew if the, if the, the, we call it, if the switchboard lit up, we did our job because wrestling fans would call in and they would be madder than hell at the heel. I can't believe y'all let that go on in your studio. And if you had enough calls, Monday night would draw. That's so wild. That's Twitter replies. Yes, exactly. In 1989. Exactly what it was. Yes. If you yes. get a lot of Twitter, it was the switchboard. <laughs> if the switchboard lit up, and you knew, we knew we were doing our job, and and a lot of times we would leave the studio, go eat lunch, and on the way back to Nashville, uh, this is when we were, and and I remember hearing stories about this. I encountered it uh, a couple of times. We would drive by from the Memphis TV studio. We would drive by. Um, the Mid-South Coliseum box office, and the people would leave their house and go down, and they wanted to be the first ones to buy their tickets because advanced tickets went on sale on Saturday. So if there was a line of tickets being sold on Saturday for the money events, we knew we did our job. That's awesome. Uh, We are here in the U.K., and so um, for my era, right, I started in 1999, and by 2003, I was invited to wrestle in the U.K. 2004, I came over for a a long period of time, and... For, that's how it kind of works and works now for the independent scene, for like the, the quote-unquote, maybe the indie stars. They kind of, almost before they break out in America, like a Jonathan Gresham or a David Starr or a Timothy Thatcher, they kind of, they kind of break overseas a little bit beforehand. But for you guys, I, I, you, and you tell me, like, would you come to the UK from Memphis? That doesn't no. seem like a thing. No, when and I broke in in April of '86, and uh, Puerto Rico and Japan were the markets that, if we were going out of the country, Puerto Rico uh, was up and down, but it, it, it was a red hot market. But Japan uh, was a, a, a super hot market. The first time. I came to the United Kingdom was in 93 for the WWF, and that's what was so odd. Uh, it, was a, a, it was a, I don't know, 12-day tour, but anyway, uh, 
it, I don't know if it was the first show, but it was it was definitely one of the first couple of shows. Uh, we all loaded on the bus. I think I wrestled Rick Martell or Coco Beware, somebody that night. Uh, but we were waiting on the bus. We were waiting on Martin, and that's the guy that I got to induct last oh. night. But I was we were waiting on Martin, and he got on. I was sitting up close to the bus, and he sat down right beside me, and that's how we struck up uh, a friendship. So, and you inducted him into the Hall of Fame. Yes, last it was very very. Uh, I, you know, I don't think Martin. I certainly don't think me or you, uh, I don't know, I won't speak for you, for me, but, but Martin, what would have happened had the WWF not come to the United Kingdom in 1989 with World of Sport off the air or, or going off the air? Oh, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. J j just where would professional wrestling be in this country without Martin rolling the dice? Well, it wasn't really a big gamble, but, 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 but the, the, the vision to get Vince to bring it, it literally, I just think the industry as a whole, because Martin is the one, if there's one person that made professional wrestling a true export, because, you know, Japan had their own wrestling, Germany had their own wrestling, Mexico had their own wrestling, but making U.S. Uh, exported around the world, Martin is the one guy that I believe changed the industry in a way uh, that isn't quite recognized to this day. And I mean, that's an interesting saying because so many people like, hate Greg Van Dyke, who's the man who took world of sport off of ITV and, and especially the wrestlers and a lot of times it's funny that you have such a different aspect because I think of it like he took away our British wrestling even though I'm from America <laughs> right but on the other side is because the British wrestling was taken away WWE be, like you said became this exported thing and now it's exported all over the world and there's the other side of the coin um, nobody's ever baby faced Greg Van Dyke, but maybe you are. You are doing <laughs> I, well, now. no, I, I'm not baby facing him. He shouldn't have done it. But no, but it opened the door. It really opened the door for, for U.S. wrestling to be an export. And then my last question, I, I, I think I'm wrong on this one, but there was the, the British, I know I'm wrong, the, the British music CD that they put out over here. Simon Cowell, I think, put it out. But was that before your time? Before my time. It was before That was your before time. my time. Did you want to? Did you want to release with my baby tonight out on the in the UK? Oh, it was released. It charted at. It charted at two or three. Oh, that was this. No, a, a couple years back ago. Back in the day. Oh well, there was a move. Was there not a movement to chart? It, it's my story. I'm going to tell it anyway. Okay. I won't. <laughs> Wait, <look. laughs> no, there was a movement. Yes. Okay. There was a movement this Hall of Fame season. Yes. Yes. Before, before, yes. Yes. But no. Um, who knows if that would have? Uh, it was. It was a catchy tune. Well, wh what's the story? Charted in the UK. There, that's just the story. It's my story. You, okay, I'm not allowed to tell <laughs> I'm it. Yes, told, told. I'm an idiot. I, <laughs> I saw the wink that he didn't give me right now. No, no, no. Nailed no, no, it. No, no. <laughs> no. Um, great. And um, so maybe, and also, uh, can you promote what you're doing now? I well, know you're very proud of it. I don't, uh, uh, yes. I'm, I'm, I, you know what? And, and it, it's, we talk about the, the evolution of the business, Fight TV. Uh, last week, uh, we were at StarCast, and, and, and that relationship with myself and, and, and Global Force and Fight, uh, I was signed up to do autographs last week in your hometown of Chicago. That's how it started back in April or May or whenever it was. And then next thing you know, we broadcast StarCast on Fight, MediaCon's on Fight, Fight is rapidly becoming, um, I call it the non-WWE network. Everybody's aware of the WWE network, but they have every, you know, StarCast, MediaCon. Is it 998? <laughs> <laughs> yes, but the NWA show, it's funny how things come full circle. Our next uh, event on Fight is uh, October the 21st. UK fans, you get to see your own. Uh, Nick Aldis, uh, you get to see... Uh, a grand, brand new national champion. We're looking at a former NWA World Heavy Champion who will, who will be there as well. So, no, the, the, the streaming side of our business has, we're in the process, but I think it's radically changing how the wrestling uh, fan, and we're both fans before we were wrestlers, how we can consume our product and fight is definitely uh, the place to be, their technology. Uh, last night I sat back in, in, in the green room and watched Dave Meltzer, I watched Colt Cabana, I watched the, the rest of the ceremony, the Hall of Fame ceremony. If you missed it, you do not want to miss that. It is 75 minutes of some very, very compelling history uh, telling, uh, very, very, good programming so yeah I, I'm, I'm super happy to be involved with fight awesome Jeff Jarrett ladies and gentlemen
Thank you. Thanks, Thanks, bye. Bye. Exciting. I saw one man clapping his chest as a way of clapping. Very nice. <laughs> All right, I'm going to take a quick break to talk about Blue Chew, one of our great sponsors. Guys, remember the days when you were ready to go? Now you can increase your performance and get that extra confidence in bed with BlueChew.com. Blue Chew brings you the first chewable with the same FDA-approved active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis, so you know they work. You can take them anytime, day or night, and since they're chewable, they work up to twice as fast as a pill. And this isn't just for guys who can't perform. It's for any guy who wants to add a little extra function to their performance. Blue Chew is prescribed online and shipped straight to your door in a discreet package. That means no in-person doctor visit, no waiting in the pharmacy, basically no more awkwardness. Blue Chew is also made in America, and since it prepares and ships directly, it's cheaper than a pharmacy. Go to BlueChew.com and get your first shipment free when you use my code COLT. Just pay $5 shipping. That's B-L-U-E-C-H-E-W.com and try it for free with that promo code COLT. All right, back to the live show. Uh, please welcome the next guest to the stage. He is uh, spearheading a movement with the NWA. He's a personal friend. He inducted me into the Hall of Fame last night. Dave Lagana. Everybody, Dave Lagana. Hello, Dave Lagana. If I break this chair, I'm sorry. I think in the spirit of professional wrestling, if you broke it over my head, we would all be happy. Or if you broke it over my head, a lot of people would be really I think happy. they'd be more happy, yes. Yeah, I don't think they'd be, why'd you cheer when you said if he broke it over my, I said that. No, bad. You're all turning heel. I also love that in the UK, a, ba a baby face, because you guys have accepted that good guy is baby face, right? I mean, it used to be blue eye, which is essentially what a good guy was, which is essentially Hitler's wet dream, like, the good guys are what Hitler loves, a blue-eyed, <laughs> blonde-haired. Did that not win you over? No, I'm okay. Out of this. <laughs> I'm staying out of this. You completely. didn't like that intro to you, me talking about Hitler? <laughs> Dude, he's a hell of a heel, I'll tell you. Um, My boss already gets in enough trouble talking about stuff like that. Fair enough. Uh, so Dave, um, I did want to, well, first of all, you put a clip on, on your Twitter the other day, finally, of you in the ring, making oh. WWE television. Uh, maybe you can explain that or talk about that a little bit. So this was 2002. Uh, I was in the company about six weeks. Oh, sorry. See, I'm not good at this. Uh, six weeks, I was in the company, and Brian Gewertz, who was the head writer of Raw at the time, said, hey, we have this skit. We're going to have Vince interviewing people to be his assistant. So it'll be this sort of wretched woman, and then it'll be this other woman, and then you. And then it'll end with Stacy dancing on there. And they gave me like all this dialogue to read. And obviously based upon this, you can know I don't. You didn't say anything. I didn't say a thing. Which, I was. Which is so funny. Cause I was like, when I saw it, I was like, oh, you were a good actor. No. But it was all based on you were an I awful did not actor. Want, I didn't want to, I didn't want to talk. So I said, what if I just sort of like cross my legs and lean in? And he's like, great, I'll chase you. And I was like, all right. He goes, and if you don't run, I'll hit you. So when you have a boss who is jacked up, you go, okay, I will run. That would be so great if he chased you and then blew out both his quads like he did in the Royal hey, Rumble. He did that, he did that on, yeah, I mean, what, uh, that not again, no. Why does this keep happening to me? Um, uh, did you, did you, so you were a writer with the WWE and, and you've done so much more and we'll talk about that in a second, but I'd like to know uh, if you had your hand on some of the UK acts or, or uh, Anything in memories from the UK? My first time we came over here, I was just thinking about this. So it was like a UK pay-per-view. It was the one, I think it was Edge versus Brock and Heyman. I think it was like 2003. And the pay-per-view was on a Sunday. And they're like, well, it's cheaper if we put you on the charter flight and we drag you around Europe for a week than you flying direct to the UK. So I went to Austria. I went to... Helsinki, Finland, somehow wandered into a sort of brothel with uh, Albert and somebody else. Uh, allegedly. Allegedly. No, it was a real... Okay. Uh, 
I mean, they allegedly did or did not yeah, do stuff with it. I allegedly know. left. Uh, okay. <laughs> but, so it was, it was so weird. We got dragged around Europe for a week. And, and put up in hotels. Oh, yeah. I was just like, this is not cheaper. And not cheaper. Not cheaper at all. But this, I, what Stephanie wanted was, that way you can learn what a European tour was like. And I learned that they're terrible. You know what I mean? They're long and, like, you work whatever. But... What about uh, the British talent? I'm trying to think of just... Trying to remember who else was... Uh, Layla came around, right? Layla. Uh, uh, DJ Gabriel. Do you have any Katie hand Birchall, in that? Uh, no, DJ Gabriel was... No, he was around, but I don't think we booked him. I, like, like Seamus was around right when I got... Like, he got hired into developmental, but as far as, like, working with, it was weird. Like, Birchall, what about the pirate? you have anything to do with the pirate? I had too much to do with the pirate. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Still, Go on. <laughs> he, uh... The best of that... That his first day as the pirate. I don't know if you've heard this story. So, uh, Alex Greenfield, who replaced me on SmackDown, thought it'd be interesting if he swung in. He had that big entrance that it was in the video game, which we were very proud of. And I was standing with Regal, and he swings in in rehearsal, lands, and blows out his knee on his big debut. So, uh, Regal, of course, was working. He just shakes his head and go. <laughs> Did they air that match? Oh, yeah. Did they air him blowing out his knee? No, because it was in rehearsal earlier in the day. Oh, okay, okay. Which is crazy now. You can go on the network and watch all this stuff. And, like, like my thing's on the network from 2000. So what did he do? He blew out his knee, but he still did his debut. So what did he do? He just taped it up? His taped mind? it up. I mean, like, it's not a it's not a five-star, six-star match here. We're talking about... Uh, I'll ask Meltzer that later, and we'll find out the answer to that. <laughs> I'm willing to bet it was not even near <laughs> one star. Uh, I'm, I'm trying. To, it's weird. Like O2 to O8, it wasn't a lot of British talents, you know, on the roster at the time. And you know, Nick was talking about Doug Williams really kind of spearheading, you know, British wrestling at the time. So it's really interesting to see how it's blown up now and and all that stuff. And it's, for me, it's exciting to come. Like Nick and I came with Ring of Honor earlier this year. And I enjoy coming all the time here. So um, and so now you are part of this movement. So I think what's really special is you've. I don't know, and you've done such a, so much successful stuff, but you've, I, I know you're, such, you're, you're very focused on how the inter internet will move wrestling forward, and you've tried to make these movements before to some success, mm -hmm. but now I feel it's really, uh, like, this is probably, I'm sure you're super, not proud of yourself, but it's finally like, okay, I knew that it had the potential to do it, and now look what we're doing, literally starting from... I wouldn't say some scratch, but almost with NWA, you were starting from under scratch, right? <laughs> Dead. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like the, the but zombies. it's not starting from a new... It's like starting from a company that kind of was... People knew what... They had heard about it and, like, looked it up, but it just... What's weird is when you meet 22-year-old kids who, who know what it is and have done the research, but 10 years ago, you couldn't do the research on it. Like, there was, you know, pre-YouTube, it was hard to find clips. Uh, to me, the best part of this is speed, and that's what I learned from you in doing the podcast. So, like... Uh, back in 2011 when I was doing my podcast, when something would happen, and we'll use Money in the Bank as the example, the fact that I can get four writers on the phone and get a podcast up within one day and people can listen to it that same day to me was like, it was so fast. And so now like when we do 10 pounds of gold, my goal was to get it up as quickly as possible. It could be better. You know what I mean? I, I wish I had four more hours here or there, but like to me, the fact that we had our version of Aldis versus Cody up on Wednesday to me was important because it was still fresh in people's minds. Like, it annoys me that like WWE 24-7, it's a year after. I don't care about the Raw after WrestleMania yeah. a year later. I want to see it that week. I was, yeah, it's so funny you say that because I had a, I basically did an audio documentary on this podcast about All In and my mind comes out every Thursday and I knew I had it ready to go on Monday. And even that five, four days, I was like, oh, I just want to put this out Monday when, like, when it was fresh on everybody's minds. Yeah, because the Bucks, I, I knew they were going to put theirs out. And I don't usually like to know when because I, it's, if it comes out at the same time, but theirs came out three hours before ours. And I just messaged them, hey, can you put these two hashtags in your YouTube thing? Because they'll, they'll link those two files together. And like, to me, that's been the most exciting part of growing a YouTube channel from zero subscribers a year ago. To, we're, we just crossed 50,000 in 11 months. That's because people like it. It's not like because we paid for them to do it. They liked it and they want to watch it. And like, they, that's the most exciting part. And what about, uh, I mean, maybe tell us a, a little bit about the passion of Billy Corrigan, who, or Corrigan. Corrigan. Cor Corrigan. Not Kurgan. Cor Cor that's oh. a different guy. Oh. What if Kurgan was running the NWA? 
Oh, my heart just... Oh. Maybe he's that shapeshifter that Billy talked about on Howard Stern. <laughs> yes, he, looked, he could look like it. Um, uh, because he's... I, wouldn't, I don't want to say desperately has been trying to be a part of wrestling, but obviously a guy with a lot of power in the world, and just in the world, um, loves pro wrestling, obviously wants to put his stamp on it, and um, he's been trying, but it looks like this is the right fit, finally. What I think a lot of people see about Billy is his money, which um, there was a Southern Belle who seemed to really enjoy him for his money a few years ago, and uh, he's got a real passion for it. The fact that it, he was in Calgary last night playing a show uh, at, th at 3 o'clock in the morning, at two hours after the show, he's messaging me asking how the segment went yesterday. Oh, I thought you were going to say he was like, I'm outside the Hart House right yeah. now. Well, he d actually did go to the Hart House oh, yesterday. Okay. Uh, I'm trying to get in the dungeon. <laughs> Learn, learn a couple moves. But like that's, that's what's insane is he's doing 12,000 people in Calgary, and he's, he'd rather be here at times. You know, he really loves wrestling. He enjoys it. He enjoys the guys. He enjoys giving creative freedom to the guys, which I think a lot of people think, oh, he's, he's hipster wrestling eccentric rock star guy, and he's not. Like, he gives me a ton of freedom. He just, as long as he knows what we're doing, he trusts us, which is, I think, the most important part, and why it succeeded. You know, all of us are, we're not the island of misfit toys, but we're pretty close. We're external from the system, and we're proving that you don't have to be in the system to work. And he's providing a platform for all of us to do it, which is exciting. Awesome. Uh, where are you and the NWA at on the Internet? That's a good question. No, if we're on all socials at NWA, which is, we have this great social guy that got us all of that just for the ability. He actually helped Cabana out uh, this past week. Like, what's nice is people really want to help each other. And I, I've tried to, at least for me, if anybody needs help, I always try and help them and without expectation. And like, that's how we got all the NWA socials when we should, there's no reason the rap group did not have all those socials. That was my joke, yeah. Ice Cube was pissed off. <laughs> uh, and when you're at Lagana? At Lagana, yeah. Yeah, Dave Lagana, everybody. All right, we got a couple more coming up here. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome to the stage a uh, dear friend of mine, Sanjay Dutz, the playa from the Himalayas. Sanjay! Sanjay, you have a- Whoa! I know, we've been getting that a lot lately. Are you lately. serious? That what, what kind of a- uh... Charade are you pulling here? Just Old some old-fashioned wrestling ribs, oh, brother. <laughs> you got one. There you go. Lagana thought he was going to die for a second. Jeez. Sorry. How are you, Colt? I'm good. What's your lapel pin? Oh, it says Impact Wrestling. It says Impact Wrestling. There you go. Yeah, okay. Good. I mean, I was going to say I've never worn a suit before, but I had to buy one for a specific trial that I you, know you, about. You look good in that suit. I saw some pictures. Did you? Yeah. I and how, how did your uh, sh uh, suit go yesterday for your, for your big night? Oh, my 30-pound Primark jacket that I had? Exactly. How, did he look good? Got a round of applause here. You, I mean, you are as sharp as ever looking. Hey, you You're a businessman now. He's showing me the tag. What does that say? Wow. Don't, don't say that out loud now. It says, custom made for Sanjay Dutt. <laughs> That's right. That's unbelievable. Who, yeah. You got a suit guy now? Uh, yeah, yeah, men's warehouse. I don't know if they have those here in the United Kingdom, men's warehouse. Uh, your equivalent would be uh, Primark. Primark. Primer? TK Maxx. TK Maxx. TK Maxx. TK Maxx. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know TK Maxx. That's yeah. us. That's American trying to fit in. <laughs> Nando's. Yeah, I know what you guys eat. <laughs> Kebab shops at 2 a.m. in the morning <laughs> with a woman with too much makeup throwing up. I know exactly what's happening. <laughs> I get you and your people. Uh, yeah, you've uh, become a bit of a businessman in the world of professional wrestling. I guess so. You could say that. Uh, do people know your... your um, I was gonna say, do people know your position? It's not really out as much as it should be. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. You, um, you don't scream it to the rafters. I don't. Those. I don't scream it to the rafters. Um, those who know know. Uh, I just do my job. Right. So for those who don't know, maybe just uh, what what is, what is your job these days? Um, well, I work backstage at Impact Wrestling. He gets the jackets, you know. <laughs> he, uh, um, the towel down. Uh, 
Yeah, I, uh, yeah I'm, I, I massage the boys before they go out, and then I wait for them to come back, and yeah. then I get the table ready. I massage them when they get back. Uh, I just get them loosened up for their matches. He's great. You know, that's it. Great backstage work. No, sorry, <laughs> you backstage work. Uh, my, my, I have a title. I have a title of Impact crew. Champion. Impact <laughs> Champion. X Division Champion. World time, but all I'm just time. Gonna step on all everything you say. <laughs> all right, what's your title? Uh, I, I'm a creative director, uh, so uh, I'm on the creative team. I produce. Uh, I handle talent relations. I wear many hats. Let's just put it like that. Include, including, and all, including the Los Angeles Raiders. Yeah, all hats. All your hats are flat brimmed. Uh, they have to be, and yours are not. Correct. I'm a I'm a bend in my hat guy. These Look, this guy right here. He's got a flat brim. There you go. Yeah. He knows what's up. Oh, another one right next to you. Yeah, see, there you go. You and got, he's got a Colt Cabana shirt on. You guys are the FBC. Yeah, 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 the, the, the flat build crew. Crew. There you go. Nailed it. <laughs> Maybe we'll talk a little wrestling for these. So, I, but, I mean, you do a lot of planning of, of putting kind of everything together. Yes. So, I mean, before your day was wrestle 15 minutes. <laughs> yes. Do nothing. Nothing. And now you're you're kind of waking up a little bit, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I kind of work to what all day. Real, to how real people live. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's 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 a job. Like for the first time in my life, it's a job, and I and I work. Like I, I actually traditionally work. I and wake up in the morning. I go to my office. I turn the computer on and conference calls and blah 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 blah. And you, I think you were on one of the one night onlys. Is that right? Or you've been you've been wrestling a little bit. I, I haven't wrestled since December of 2017. Right. Yes. What, which was that? that uh, or just I, TV? Yeah, I did TVs uh, late 2017. But other than that, I've done nothing. And so you, especially on this podcast, you were a guy who came on and championed the trips. Yeah. We went to India together. Absolutely. We went all over the place. Absolutely. And your wrestling bookings are very few and far between by choice. By choice. Does I, that I, drive you crazy? You know what, sometimes it does. Sometimes I really miss it, man. I really do. Sometimes I'll be scrolling my feed and, you know, I'll see a trip that you're on or something. And, ah, man, I'd love to do that. I'd love to get out, get out on the road. I'd love to sit at the, 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 the merch table and, and hope that somebody buys my picture <laughs> or my T-shirt. Uh, but then sometimes uh, I think, man, I don't miss it at all. Uh, so, it, you know, ebbs and flows uh, on how I feel about that. But, but it is by choice. I, I, I had an injury. I had surgery. And then just uh, I was just inundated in my, my uh, backstage duties behind the camera. And, and like, like we talked, we just said, it's, it's a job. It's, it's work. You go to work every day. It's a full-time, 24 hours a day job. So uh, it, was, it was like, how do I balance and juggle all this? And I think it's a good wean out if, that's, if you're going out. To like, you're still, I mean, you're still there, obviously. Of course. I mean, I love, I mean, I'll never do anything other than professional wrestling in, in some way, shape, or form. That's all I've ever done. So uh, this is like a great fulfilling thing where I can still be my creative self and, and still be in the professional wrestling industry and contribute. And wrestle if you want. I mean, and wrestle if I want to. Hey, if uh, Eddie Edwards gets hurt. <laughs> I don't know about that. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but if somebody wants to do a tour of India, yes. you and I can go again. This is correct. And then, imp so Impact, since your, you and your regime have taken over, yes. you guys have slow and steadily really, and I think that was the plan, it's, it's, it's got to be rewarding for you, have really started to change the minds of the wrestling fan. I, I hope so, uh, absolutely. Uh, it, it, it's... Um, it's a process. It doesn't happen overnight, but but I do feel that uh, we've made a lot of strides in, in a very short amount of time, um, way way more strides than I thought we would do at this point in, in our tenure. Uh, especially like Slam Anniversary back in July. I don't know if you guys saw Slam It was, you know, just uh, just a great great response coming out of Slam Anniversary. So um, really really made us feel good and that we were we're, we're on the right path. Yeah yeah and. Um I think that would, that would, yeah, that would be such a, a hard thing to do. But what's, what's, the, what's the game plan when you go in there and there was so much just s stuff on the Internet that you realize you have to do some, some damage control? Like, what yeah. do you and the other team kind of like, hey, this is our kind of long term to kind of fix well, this? I, I, right. I think you've got to change the entire perception, and through that it, it, it's with the talent, you know, um, because at the end of the day – Everybody's watching for the talent, and everybody's watching for the wrestling. So, uh, you know, we kind of... Uh, I'm watching for the booker and the uh, segment writer. Uh, that's just me. 
but you know, we, we, we had to kind of uh, flip-flop the roster, uh, a, a new presentation, a different presentation on the talent, on the way the show was presented. If you watch the show from before compared to now, it's a, it's a completely different presentation. Uh, and, and you know, just, man, just be stable and, and bring stability back to everything. Stability, great. Where can uh, people find Impact and Sanjay Dutt on the internet? Impactwrestling.com. Um, I'm going to do a plug for our show tonight at 5 p.m. right here. So if you're coming by, absolutely. LAX versus Johnny Storm and Jody Fleisch. Jimmy H Havoc versus Sammy Callahan. Impact Wrestling is on uh, Fight Network and Five Spike here in the U.K. Impact on Pop in the States. And uh, at Impact Wrestling across everything. Sanjay at, at Sanjay Dutterson. Great Twitter over here. Sanjay Dutt, everybody. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thanks, Colt. Appreciate it, buddy. Maybe I'll move it onto one pallet here, so. All right, let's take a quick break and remind you that I was at a Hall of Fame ceremony, and that means I had to dress up nice. Our sponsor, Twillery, helped make that happen. Twillery shirts are comfortable, easy to care for, look great, fit perfectly, and make the shirt shopping process easy. Twillery's proprietary safe cotton technology uses less harsh chemicals than other non-iron shirts, giving them a buttery soft feel. You heard me right, non-iron shirts. It's a good thing I just threw out my ironing board. Just throw these shirts in your bag or in the corner of your closet. They'll still be ready to wear no need to worry about wrinkles. The slimming, tailored fit can be worn tucked or untucked, and the brush nickel collar keeps collars looking sharp. They got good deals, too. Save when you bundle. A $100 shirt is only $55 when you buy in bulk. Shipping is also free. Returns are also free. Get $25 off your first shirt order by going to twillery.com slash colt and entering the promo code colt at checkout. That's T-W-I-L-L-O-R-Y dot com slash Colt. The promo code is Colt, and you'll get that $25 off your first shirt order. Uh, okay, we got uh, two more guests. Hope you guys are uh, in for it. Yeah. All right. Please welcome to the stage, maybe hobbling on the stage, Jonathan Gresham, everybody. Yes. Oh, I didn't realize I was up there. Hey, look at me. Hey. Sure, sure, I sent them the new, the new graphic for the new podcast, but I'll take what I can get. Uh, John, I saw last night, uh, maybe nursing a bit of an injury. How are we feeling today? I'm feeling a lot better. Last night, I wasn't really sure what was happening, but uh, I just rolled my ankle, so it was a bit sprained and swollen. I'm okay, though. You're okay. Yeah. That's good to hear. We're all happy. I've said this before, as I'm watching two men wrestle in a, in a ring over there. <laughs> Who's what? I'm sorry, I'm putting this to a pause, but there is two men beating the crap out of each other from WrestlingTravel.org, and they are just, it's a legit, this is Shamrock and Severin. This is Shamrock and Owen Hart in that weird octagon they built in WWE. Who won, guys? Who won? Oh, they both are claiming ownership. It was a good match. It was a round of applause for those two. Either wrestling or having sexual pleasures together, we're not sure which one. Uh, I, but I always say as a wrestler, like when an injury happens to me, and this has happened with my ankle before, like the moment it happens, we say to ourselves, oh, that's one week out of wrestling, or oh, I think I'm three months out of wrestling. So this was fresh last night. Did you have that moment to yourself? like? Oh, this is my bookings are now going to be gone for a month. Well, yeah, like um, I was in pain, of course, but like I, I mostly just grabbed my ankle and put my head to my knee and I started praying that like it wasn't really bad because you just never know. You know what I mean? Um, I've had several injuries this year, which is really bad with the same leg. So uh, the bookings didn't come to mind, but just me being not being able to work is the most. Well, that's not being able to work means yeah. not be, well, getting paid, well, which yeah, means yeah, yeah, yeah. the bookings are gone and um, we have to struggle. You're are you, you're full. Are you? You're full-time wrestling now, is that right? Yes. Yeah. How, um, how long have you been full-time wrestling? Well, how long have you been wrestling? I've been wrestling for 13 years. And when were you able to make the leap into full-time? Uh, or what was your last job, I'd say? My last job, I was an audio-visual technician at a power company. Oh, can you help us out with this, actually? I mean, I could. <laughs> I don't want to, but I could. And what was the moment where you're like, 
Fuck this, I'm out of here. Um, I was on and off with that. My boss was really cool because he was a wrestling fan. So it was back, uh, really back in 2008 when I started to uh, branch out. I would only come back to the States for about three months and actually work my job. Um, so back in 2008, so about 10 years now. So it's been, it's been a good run for you. I mean, I wasn't living the life now. Yeah. So don't. <laughs> but it's also, I, I wasn't, you know, when I first started to wrestle full time, I wasn't living the life, but there was just some, there's just this moment of pride in your heart where you're like, I'm just a wrestler. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Being able to, uh, to travel abroad, because that's what I was doing mostly, was just like a dream come true for me. Something I never thought I'd be able to do. Yeah, so uh, take us through this a little bit, because we're here in the UK, and I thought it was important to have you on here, because you were, um, you were a part of this special group. You know, I'd like to include myself and Brian Danielson and Chris Hero, uh, uh, of these guys who just decide, Chad Collier is another one, who just decide to kind of see all the wrestling that's happening in the UK, and then realize like oh maybe that's a good place for me to kind of hang out for a little bit is that what, what was the decision for you to kind of start coming over here and then start kind of wrestling here uh, a lot or living over here is that right yeah yeah uh mine was uh long story short i was wrestling for a company back home in georgia and uh the promoter basically told me that i wasn't like a main event style wrestler and that he would always keep me at the bottom of the card so I said to myself, there has to be someone somewhere that sees something more in me than just that. So that's when I started branching out of my state, and that turned into me getting an a opportunity in France first, actually. So I started wrestling in France first, and that rolled over to uh, a who, Brian Dixon tour. So who brought you Who was the French promoter? Uh, Marc Mercy for FFCP. Okay. Um, and he ran like tours like Dixon, but only in France. So you were doing the holiday camps? Yeah. Or you were working every day in France? Yes, I was working every day. And what was that like? Did the guys speak English? Um, a few of them, but uh, he would bring guys. He was, like, um, really into, like, shoot fighting and stuff. So he would actually bring over, like, legit guys from, like, Africa and, like, Russia and stuff like that. So I was working with guys that are, like, legit shoot fighters Did you wrestle the great power of Udi by any chance? No. Oh, a boy can dream. <laughs> Uh, and then you started doing the, the camps over here in England? Yeah, because uh, Soraya Knight actually hooked me up because she ended up, her and her daughter was on a tour for Mark Mercy, and we met, and then she hooked me up, and I went over and stayed with her and her family, and that was my first tour for uh, Brian Dixon. Are you going to be in the movie? I doubt it. I wasn't that big of a oh. <laughs> part in their lives. What is it, wrestling with my family or something? What's that called? Is that right? Did I nail it? I just watched the preview the other day that... That weird two-minute clip of The Rock, like, oh, I mean, I'll watch it, obviously. It's a wrestling movie. I'll watch any wrestling movie. But, uh, all right, we'll, we'll give anything a chance, right, as wrestling fans? All right, there you go. A mild clap. <laughs> um, I thought of, we did some Rev Pro TV tapings a couple days ago, and I thought of you specifically, and um, because, I mean, so this was... I guess my first time on UK TV, I was on the wrestling channel a lot back in the day, but this is like promoting wrestling, t promoting British style wrestling on television. And uh, I, I, assumed it, I assumed it meant something to you too, to be able to wrestle whatever style you wanted, which is, I think it's a lot of influence by the British style. Definitely. And do it on television. Did it mean a lot to you? Oh uh, yeah, just um, for me being accepted into the uh, British scene because I know when I first started it was uh, very difficult to be accepted by some of the boys. I mean, for me anyway. Do they call you a septic? No, no. They called me a septic. Wow. A septic tank. Yank. That's one for you at home. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, it meant a lot, man, because I just feel like um, over the years I've just been able to accomplish things I never thought I would. So that was, it meant a lot to me to be able to uh, be accepted by these guys and brought in. Yeah. And then also you're doing Ring of Honor television. Yes. Uh, you're on ROH TV every week. Yes. Uh, that's also, I imagine, got to be a good feeling. I know that's probably somewhere you were trying to, before you went over to Europe, probably trying to get your foot in the door in 2007 or 2006. No, to be honest, everything went Just in kidding. I mean, me. no, you weren't <laughs> trying to do that. I mean, everything was, to, I'd, to be honest, I'd never thought I'd make it this far in wrestling, like being a part of Ring of Honor, wrestling with the people that I've been wrestling with is just something that is just like a real big wild thing for me. Uh, being able to travel the world was like my only real goal and it was like, oh, if I could do that, I wonder if I could do this. So I started trying for Ring of Honor and now I'm in Ring of Honor. And you're on television and 
you're you're one of these. I, I think you're a throwback to how Ring of Honor was and started. Is like the young, hungry, independent wrestler who's slowly, slowly, slowly going to get over. And I don't want to jinx anything, but um, I've been able to commentate and I've been able to watch you really progress so well. And you could talk about it a little bit, but I, to me, I think it's these matches with Jay Lethal that have, have really been incredible. And someone asked me what my favorite match to call was. Yeah, you can, yeah, please feel free. Uh, they asked me what my favorite match to call was so far, and the first one that came to mind was not the one in Atlanta, but you and Jay Lethal beforehand. North Carolina. In North Carolina. And I really, really enjoyed calling that match as a commentator. I imagine you enjoyed it as a wrestler. Um, and so it's nice to watch you kind of move up, move up the card and your stock rise within the promotion. And I think it's only going to be a matter of, you know, whatever it is, a matter of time before it, it kind of gets to where I think you want it to get. All right, I definitely hope so. Yeah, that... that uh that throwback style that you speak of, that you, Danielson, uh, uh, CD, all Nigel. those guys. Yeah, Nigel, yeah. man, that was, I still study those things to this day. That's what uh, really made me want to move on in wrestling and gave me like an idea of where I wanted to be and what I wanted to do. At first, it's just I wanted to have fun, you know, and just uh, see how far I could go. Then when I watched that for the first time, I think in 2005, that's when I was like, oh, Ring of Honor would be cool to go to, but I never thought it you know, would happen. Uh, where are you at on the internet? I am on Twitter and Instagram. If you like cats and food, follow me on Instagram because I post a lot of that. Twitter, I try to uh, get my shows over and whatnot, but uh, I normally just retweet whatever Chris posts. Chris Brooks, yeah. And what, what are those handles? Okay, uh, Twitter is uh, at the John Gresham, and Instagram is just Jonathan Gresham. All right, Jonathan Gresham, everybody. <laughs> so I just leave now. All right. All right, uh, and we have one last uh, main eventer and a Hall of Famer, and I'm excited to get him on stage and have a chat. Please welcome Dave Meltzer to the stage. How you doing? Hey. What's happening? Dave. Yes. Great to see you. You are sticking by that sweatshirt, yeah? <laughs> it's becoming my trademark. It really has. I know, ever since like last, uh, last couple of weeks. ProWrestlingTees.com slash uh, Wrestling Observer. We can, we can, I'll, we'll get a deal on there for that. <laughs> uh, so great to see you. Um, great to see you, too. Congratulations, obviously. Uh, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm excited to talk to you uh, about the UK scene and um, just in general. So I would like to, I mean, you've been doing your observer letter for so long yeah D did you notice a time where you realized that you had uh, a uk presence and people from i mean i mean i think like w way way back um i got some but then we had like a uk distributor and i've had that for probably god i don't know 10 15 years so i knew that there was a some following and then when we started doing the online stuff you know with the with the um podcast and everything Brian was always telling me, like, we got a lot of readers from the UK, a lot of subscribers from the UK. And, you know, in recent years, I've been trying to cover it more and more with um, Revolution Pro and Progress and, um, you know, some of the other companies as well, you know, and, and, and now with World of Sport and everything. It's like, it's just interesting. It is a really interesting time period for the UK with WWE going so hard, signing so many guys. Um, and when I mean, when I was over here, when I first came in 2004, I mean, those guys couldn't make more than 20 pounds. Like, it's, it was amazing. They, the, you know, Birchall was the, one of the first ones, at least from, like, my generation. Like they, like, they had to go through Finley to go through Drew McDonald to, like, please take one of our guys. And they were like, fine, we'll take Birchall. I mean, he was great, obviously. Yeah. But not, and then, you know, and then Stu uh, Sanders and maybe uh, Drew McIntyre. But now they're, everyone's really getting the due that they deserve. Yeah, well, I think that one of the things here is that some of the guys, I guess because the ge geography and everything and the number of shows, that there are guys, like, I, I remember what, like, Liguero, I think, said that he'd, like, wrestled 300 matches in a year. And in the United States, nobody can do that kind of a schedule yeah. anymore. And Liguero's so, doing, not only in one year, but he's been doing it for the past 10 years. Yeah. So it's 300 matches every, it's not like he did this one thing in a year. Yeah. He is getting the reps, right? And what's happening is... The UK wrestlers are getting a lot of reps. Well, look at look at like you know Dunn and Baden, those guys who are young, you know, really young, and they're they're great. I mean, 
I, I think the thing that it, it impresses me so much is when they go to NXT, it's like they're seen as like, like the big superstars coming over as opposed to, you know, even three years ago, they were pretty much unknown. Like when they first came, I saw um, Pete Dunne in PWG with Mark Andrews, who had been around, has been around for a long time. And it was like, I knew he was good. I'd never seen him live, but it was like, the, those, you know, the little things where you really see a guy's got a certain level of intensity and stuff that I was surprised at just how good those guys were. And they're much better now than they were, you know, even a couple of years ago. Uh, okay, tell me, I'm interested about this distributor. Um, so what happened? Someone over here was like, hey, you've got a big... Because I want to know kind of before the internet, because I like the idea of yeah. you were writing, you were sending out the newsletters by mail, yeah. right? And, and so someone came to you with a business deal and said, I want to send them out, out Yeah, here? well, they just said that, like, you, you, you would have a lot of a following here. I had some, but you would have a lot, but it takes so long to get there, you know, because of the mail. And people in the UK will be more apt to buy something from, from a UK address than from a California address. And I said, okay. And so uh, we set something up. And um, I had a couple of distributors, but one for like a long, long, long time. And um, So how would that work? You would send the file over? I would send the file as soon as I was done. I would send the file. So really because of the, um, the, guy, the people in the UK would actually get it before the people in the United States unless they lived in Northern California because, you know, the geography and the mail's quicker. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, take three days there and these guys would have it first. So, I mean, what ended up happening as the Internet got bigger is the UK fans would start, um, you know, saying what was in the Observer before. And some of the American fans would go, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. It's already on the Internet and we haven't even gotten in the mail. Right. So that kind of like, you know, kind of pushes you where you almost have to distribute it by the Internet. Yeah. You know, it pushed that, that change. Were you, yeah, were you hesitant to do the internet or were you did you i mean because well, you real you see the trends in wrestling so yeah. you obviously see the trends in society i would assume yeah yeah the male thing was 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 good i mean it was successful and then all of a sudden in 2004 i saw that um it was changing um and wade keller actually did it first brian alvarez did it before me as well and it's like well this is the the thing i was late i was late to the game but i wasn't too late to the game right um but I mean, as far as um, I did it, the thing is, I did it once earlier, and it was a complete disaster. A couple, of, so so that's why I kind of backed off because I had worked with a distributor, and they had said like, and they had lied to me about numbers. You ever work with somebody where it's like you think they're your partner, and then it's like they're not ripping you off because I can't say that, but they would lie about the numbers, and all of a sudden it's like I thought I was doing really really well, and I was actually doing pretty crummy on the internet, mm -hmm. and. So like my mail numbers were going down and I thought, well, but my internet numbers are going up. And then I found out that they were, the way they were counting was not the way I was counting. Well, that's why I'm like, I don't know, like my story a little bit as I get so paranoid is a lot of people will reach out and I'm sure you get this is like, how can I, I, I want to help your, I want to do your website. I want to do this. I want to do that. I'm so hesitant because it's just like, because yeah, you don't trust it. How can you I write? I realize that I'm the only one, I'm the one that's most invested in myself and I, I believe in myself the most, and it's hard. But obviously, you've taken on this partnership with Brian, and I think it's been amazing, right? It's been fantastic. I mean... Um, Brian Alvarez. Yeah, Brian Alvarez is my partner for um, at the Wrestling Observer website. And, um, yeah, I mean, it wasn't even like... It was one day I was at a UFC show, and I was just, you know, between, the, between working for Yahoo and the Observer, I was fried. I remember it was, it was uh, Anderson Silva fight, I think it was in Ohio, and I was sitting there trying to write a story and my, you know, have you ever get like your brain's just blank? You know what I mean? I just- All the time. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, it's like, I just, I was just fried and I called him up and I go like, I'm working too hard and this isn't making sense. And we're both duplicating what we do. Um, and Brian was like, well, you know, you are the most popular guest because I would do a show every other week. And, and then we worked it, we worked it out over about a week or two and you know, like, but we'd been friends for years and years and years. So it was like, I didn't have any trust issues with him whatsoever. And, um, but it, it was a risk, and within like two days of going together, it was like, you know, the subscriptions just shot through the roof, and it was like, I, it was really good because it was like, there was that uncertainty, but like within two days, the uncertainty was gone, we knew it was the right move. That's nice. Uh, I'll listen to you a lot, and I know you, for your amazing knowledge about wrestling, no one's questioning that, sometimes you, you admit that you, you're not too up to date on the, on the old world of sport, or that wasn't your forte. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I read the, the magazines, and, but I didn't have, like, a lot of coverage when I was in the 70s. I didn't really have a lot of coverage of Europe at all. I knew the, I knew the names of the big stars, um, and I had seen some world of sport tapes of, like, you know, Marty Jones and Rollerball Rocco and, um, 
you know, when somebody like, people like that, sometimes, you know, it's because the conversion was different, you know, as far as the tapes. So that, I think you guys have PAL or something like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah and we were like NT, SC, so. That was so, it? Yeah, yeah, right, so it wasn't so easy to get, like, I knew people in the UK, but getting the tapes converted was, was really hard. So I think that that, um, you know, that held it up or else I probably would have watched it like I watched Japan. And, um, you know, but in, in recent years with the internet, it's just like, I mean, it's just crazy. Like, someone will just go, I, I mean, I like go on my Twitter and just go like, oh, you're seeing Walter and Jordan Devil in this, you know, today. And it's like, you know, within a day or two, you can go and see the match. But so back then, was there like this lore in your head of like, because you could never really watch that much or sometimes it has like a better, like, in your head, uh, of what it is as opposed to being able to watch it. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I saw enough of it to where I can't say that. I was, because it was different. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of the guys went to Japan too. So the guys who went to Japan, I saw all the time, you know, and, and um, but yeah, there were, there were, I'm sure there's a generation of guys or like sort of like the, the superstar guys I saw, but then like the next level down guys who may not have gone to Japan, but were really good. Those were the guys I really didn't know about, but I knew about like Jim Brakes and people like that, you know, even, you know, way back when. Um, but I mean, you knew a lot more than me because I remember talking to you about that stuff when you went, when you started going, you became like a student of the UK business. And so I was always fascinated like hearing from you because you, you know, you and Chris Hero yeah. came here, you know, early, early on compared to everybody else. And yeah, we, and we, I, I found some guy, uh, his name was Paul, he would just give me, he once gave me a stack of like 60 DVDs, and that's how we had to do it. I would go on the, I would go on the um, elliptical with my mini DVD player, and I would watch just hours and hours of World of Sport before they were on YouTube, honestly. And yeah. now, I, a little bit of me is like, ugh, everyone can watch. I felt like such a hipster back then. <laughs> like, only well, I knew him. That's, that's like when I first started with the Japan, you know what I mean? Like right. there's, there's like 10 of us in the United States that actually got Japan tapes, and they were really good. And like now, you know, but, but I, it's actually better, though. It's for 100% better. Yeah, I mean, when I talk, well, you know, like, like, you know, like last night when we were talking about, um, I mean, I was kind of fascinated when I brought up the uh, Omega Okada. It's like, you know, a large percentage of the people here had seen that match. And, um, you know, years ago, it would have been like, you know, five people in the whole room, you know, could have seen it. All right, I do want to, uh, before we uh, let you go, I do, I, I want to, not a scoop, but uh, you're, you're not, I, I, I feel I have you on stage, I have the right to just ask whatever I want about anybody. So I'm a little bit intrigued about, uh, uh, Loch Ness in WCW, who was oh, 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 um, um, Haystacks. Haste, giant Haystacks, yeah. yeah. How come he didn't work out? What happened? He was, I think he was just too old and past his prime when he came. They, were, they brought him in for Hogan. Right. I don't know if you know that. Yes. Yeah, because I remember when, um, and I had seen him, and, and he was already past his prime, because I remember when they brought him in for, for Hogan, and I said, it's, it's not going to work. You saw it right away. I, before he even came. I, to, I told him, before, when they told me they were bringing him in, I said that, like, he's past his prime, it's not going to work. And they said, isn't he, like, 6'11", 600 pounds? And I go, like, I don't know exactly what he is, but he, he's huge, but he's not that mobile anymore. I mean, he, I know he was a legend here at the time. So I had, like, told him, and then he came in, and, and like, probably within a week or two, they soured on him, you know, because he just didn't have the mobility anymore. And when WCW brought in, um, so they brought in Finley and Dave Taylor, and obviously Regal was kind of the first one of those people to come over. Do you remember, was there, and there's one specific name that I, I guess I would say, but was there anyone that was supposed to come over that, well, I guess a, a couple names, and I'll leave this with you. I, I was always, in, I don't know if Tony Sinclair was supposed to get some kind of push. He definitely looked the part. Yeah. And also, uh, Robbie Brookside and Doc Dean came over and did a they worldwide were just enhancement guys, yeah. Yeah, well, before they were enhanced, but they were kind of getting a little push in worldwide and trying to get a thing. Um, I don't know if you ever heard about these guys and their, the lack of success for the Brits in America. Well, you know, back, there wasn't a lot of, um, you know, it was, the style was different and people were a lot more, don't you think the people in the United States that ran the business were way more narrow-minded when it came to style? Right. Like, it's like, before, with the exception of like Billy Robinson and Tony Charles, who I guess adapted well, most of the time people would come and they would go, oh, you know, that stuff, it's so, you know, they, they would just, because it wasn't American style. And unless, like in California, it was okay to do lucha because they drew money. But in the rest of the country, it's, ah, that lucha, it's such garbage, right? Or, or te South Texas. And then I think with the British guys, I think because Vern really respected Billy Robinson as a shooter, and he'd had some success in other places, and he was, and he'd had success in Japan, to where Billy got a giant push. But most of the British guys were kind of like mid-card technical wrestlers and... 
you know, they're fine on the card. Even when they, would, when they would have a great match on the card, it's like, well, it's not going to draw money. Cause, right. You know, so they were, they were kind of, it wasn't a great demand for those guys, even though I think that there was a mentality that technically they're very good. And it's, you said the promoters are narrow-minded, but also the wrestlers, too. It's funny you say that because it just remi reminded me of remembering watching um, some of those matches and seeing that they were doing the British style, and I could see some of the wrestlers being like, this is weird. We just do punches and kicks over here in America. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah and they didn't, they didn't do, and here they didn't do punches at all, right? Right, yeah, it wasn't legal. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> and I think we should keep it that way. <laughs> uh, Dave, can you give a little plug for, uh, for The Observer and yourself yeah, on uh, Twitter? Yeah, so, so for those of you guys who uh, don't know about it or, or don't get it, you can go to WrestlingObserver.com, and uh, Brian Alvarez and I, we do, um, you know, three to five podcasts a week. I do The Observer, which is a long, um, you know, it's, it's all the news, all um, match coverage, a lot of behind-the-scenes news. I've been doing it for 36 years. It's, um, I, I like to believe it's the number one newsletter in the world. I'm sure, I'm sure it is, you know, circulation-wise. Even though, like, the guys who do other newsletters are actually my friends, so I don't want to be too much about that, but... It was so nice seeing you, you guys in the torch just, like, hand-in-hand hand last week. That was so cute. I know, I know. And, you know, it's funny. I mean, Bruce Mitchell and I have been, have been best friends for 30 years, and Wade Keller and I, I knew him as a teenager, and we were really good friends, and then... For years, we, it's not like we were enemies, but we just, he did his thing and I did my thing, and we didn't really talk, and then I, I saw him in Waterloo when I got inducted to the Waterloo Hall of Fame, and he came. He actually invited me to fly to Minneapolis and drive together, and I would have done it except my parents and my son were coming on the trip, so I go, well, my whole family's coming, so we're going to go straight to Waterloo, and then when we were there, we just kind of talked a lot, and yeah, it was a really fun weekend for me, hanging out with with, with them, and um, yeah, it's, because I think a lot of people perceived us as, like, enemies, you know what I mean? I know I did, I th yeah. Yeah, we, I, we, never, we never really... Not I mean, enemies, but I assume there was some kind of, I don't know, weird internal there, struggle there, or there, something. There, 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 there probably was in certain <laughs> yeah. points, but I never, really, I never really thought of it that way, and, um, but when we were young, when, well, I, you know, I was young too, but when he was real young, I mean, we used to talk all the time. I, when he first started, I... Um, I saw his newsletter and I thought it was like, okay, this is like the, the best guy out there. So I got like two choices. I could either be like a complete, because I was already established. I could be like a complete dick, you know what I mean? Just, uh, you know, or I could be a nice guy and help him through. So my mentality was just like, I don't want to be that guy, that, that, you know, territorial, defending your territory guy. I never want to do that. So I always, you know, even I was always wanting to be nice and friendly with them, you know. That says a lot about you. <laughs> well, I, I'll, I'll and and where, where are you at? You have your own personal Twitter, right? I'm on Twitter. I'm, I make a fool of myself on Twitter on a regular basis. So if you ever want to see that and uh, all the different controversies, because there's people who try to get under my skin, mentioning certain guys and everything, which I'm trying to get away from. But, I was just asking the Twitter handle for to talk uh, Dave Meltzer, W-O-N. There you go. So uh, if you want to go on Twitter, yeah. All right. Uh, give it up for Dave Meltzer, everybody. I'll be back out here in just a couple minutes with Kenny McIntosh, by the way. Colt, great to see you. Great to see you. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, Dave, yes, thank you. All right. Uh, all right, that is the show for this week. Um, I'm going to go back to my apartment right now, and I'll probably be talking about some of my plugs and... You nailed it. We got one. Uh, okay. Uh, let's hold on. Wait before I do that. Uh, I. Uh, this is me and my process in my apartment too. Okay. Uh, let. That is the show for today. A uh, big round of applause for you guys for coming up here. Let's give a huge thank you to my guests: Jeff Jarrett, Dave Lagana, Sanjay Dutt. Jonathan Gresham and Dave Meltzer. I'm gonna go to my studio right now and do some plugs and... There it is. Um, all right, thank you much, everyone. All right, thank you much. <laughs> oh, it's been a long weekend. Thank you very much, everybody. This has been the Art of Wrestling for Colt Cabana. I'm Colt Cabana, thanks.